Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for having me at uh, the DEF CON Delhi Security Conference. Um, so this talk is going to be about Docker for bug bounty hunting and penetration testing in general. All right, now, before we actually get started with anything, I just want to clear up a few things regarding what I'll be covering in this video. So, of course, I'll be taking you through setting up Docker on Linux and uh, the various commands that will help you get started in effective um, so we'll be talking about the tools and the environment and then we'll move on to setting up a hacking lab with docker and uh, again i'll show you how to use various toolkits that you can use for your bug bounty assessments uh, and your any of your penetration tests all right so let's get started um, first of all if, if anyone of you has, has never heard of docker or hasn't used it um, docker is a, essentially a system that allows you to build and deploy applications and services in the form of containers, right? So an easy way of looking at this is, is comparing it to your typical hypervisor like VirtualBox where you have virtual machines. So I'll get to the comparison in a second. So it is a platform as a service offering that utilizes the host operating system kernel as opposed to you know typical hypervisors like VMware and VirtualBox, right? So instead of actually uh, utilizing VMs and the typical VM infrastructure, they all all of the containers uh which is the name of the the actual virtual machines or the isolated uh vms uh, all use the host operating system kernel this will become much easier to understand in a second so the containers are are what you would call like vm templates or vms right so the containers contain the dependencies and the libraries that the application or service needs to run therefore eliminating the need for installing dependencies and managing the operating system uh, or managing an entire other operating system. And uh, Docker containers are much more efficient than VMs as they, they utilize the host kernel as opposed to virtualizing an entire other operating system. So uh, just to explain this really simply, let me just take you through a bit of a history with hypervisors and uh, and you know, virtualization technology, just to show you how, how, how great Docker is. So uh, let's start off with a simple uh, example where, you know, uh, if you're uh, usually in the early 90s, uh, going, sorry, the early 2000s uh, and the late 90s, you know, companies started utilizing applications, you know, it could be mail servers, uh, hosting their own websites, web applications, so on and so forth. And so companies started migrating or started utilizing the internet for business, right? Which meant they now needed to, to buy servers so that they could host these applications, the mail servers, so on and so forth. Um, so typically what would happen is that the IT, uh, the, uh, the IT team would, uh, would look around for servers that they would want and they would buy an entire server rack um, and, 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 you know, based on their requirements, of the application they would you know then buy one with the appropriate resources but in many cases what happened is they would buy a much more powerful server than they actually needed and what would happen is that utilization would remain low throughout its lifespan and you know the application would only uh, account for maybe five or ten percent of the overall system resources so people would always buy things that were or servers that were more powerful because uh, you it was really difficult to predict load and what type of load you'll be you know you, you'll be expecting so people would always buy the most expensive and the most uh, beefed up versions and the, the obvious problem here is that there was under utilization of these resources because these servers would essentially just sit in the server room or in a closet somewhere and they would only be running one application so this was highly inefficient so that's where companies like v v vmware and later on virtualbox from oracle came in and they introduced hypervisor technology which allowed you to host more than one operating system which means you can now host more than one application on the same server, which was really great because now they could host their mail, uh, their mail server. They could then host uh, their web application. And again, you could host a Linux box, you could host a Windows box. So for example, if they were running their mail exchange service on Windows server, they could host an, a VM with Windows server. And if they were running their mail server using Ubuntu, they could host that separately. And that means that system resources were now being utilized much better than they were before. However, the obvious issue here, the obvious is uh, problem was that uh, it, with these hypervisor solutions like VMware and VirtualBox, you had to virtualize another operating system, which means those resources or half the resources will be consumed by that other operating system 
uh, and then the, the rest is left to the application. So for example, if we take a look at this image here, you can see exactly what I'm talking about. So here we have a, uh, our containerized applications uh, and I'm talking about Docker and the other containerized solutions are LXC, which is Linux containers. And here you have your typical hypervisor uh, infrastructure, which you can now understand what I'm saying. So you have your hardware infrastructure and then you have your hypervisor, which is VirtualBox or VMware. And the, you know, this is obviously running on the host operating system. And then you have your virtual machines. Now, the problem is quite obvious here. You can see that the guest operating system that you're virtualizing is taking up more than half of the resources that you've allocated to that virtual machine. So, for example, if you if you are hosting a Windows 7 VM, half of it would go to hosting the, uh, the operating system and the, the rest will be left to the application. So that's highly inefficient because the app then is left with what's left over. And again, this was another form of inefficiency that many people were you know, talking about because you essentially had to host entire other operating systems. And then what, what comes with that is the additional cost of licensing for these other operating systems. And then you need to manage those operating systems. You need to have administrators constantly patching them, so on and so forth. Now with Docker, what you have is you have your, your hardware infrastructure. You then have your host operating system. In this case, uh, in the case of this presentation, I'm going to be talking about Linux. You can run Docker on Windows to host Windows uh, containerized applications, but that's beyond the scope of this talk. And uh, so again, you have your host operating system, which can be Ubuntu, Fedora, it really doesn't matter. And then you have Docker, right? Docker runs, the, the Docker daemon runs right over here on top of the host operating system. And then you have your containerized applications that are all using the host operating system, right? So they're all utilizing the host kernel right of you, which means you do not have to virtualize entire operating systems. So what does that mean? That means number one, they're faster loading speeds and startup speeds. Secondly, much more, uh, much better system resource consumption and optim and utilization. And you can see in, in the case of these two, these are or the, the, both of these setups have the same hardware, hardware infrastructure and configuration, which means, uh, for example, they have both, they both have eight gigs of RAM, uh, dual core, you know, CPU, and you can see that in the in the case of containers, you can run more. Uh, you can actually run twice the amount of um, containerized applications than you can VMs with the same configuration. So it's a much improved efficiency. Now that we understand the difference between Docker and traditional hypervisors, uh, we can actually, you know, we can actually start taking a look at the advantages of using Docker for pen testing and bug bounty hunting. Right. So as I've mentioned, uh, Docker works on uh, it works on Linux, uh, Windows, Mac OS. So it provides you a multi-platform solution or base for running containers. So you can run your tools and environments on multiple operating systems. And because uh, of the, the ability to containerize uh, configurations and, uh, and to, ha to have the containerized systems, you now have the, the uh, Kali Linux and Parato OS uh, images, uh, and I'll talk about the difference between images and containers in a second, with full repository support, which means you can easily uh, set up multiple instances of, uh, of Kali and Parrot and you know, set them up with your own configuration. Uh, you then also have your containerized vulnerable web applications like the OASP Juice Shop, uh, the DAM vulnerable web application that can be used for training and learning. Right, so you can easily set them up for students if you're currently hosting a CTF, and this will all become apparent in, uh, when we take a look at the, pract the practical aspect here. All right, you then have your, your pen testing and bug bounty toolkits, which I currently set up. And the reason I set up a bug bounty toolkit for myself with Docker is because uh, whenever I'm performing a penetration test, I usually, I usually set up a cloud instance, which means I want the exact same configuration of tools wherever or whenever I set up a new cloud instance. And it was really becoming quite cumbersome installing all the tools manually. Even if I created a bash script to install them, it was really inconvenient because uh, in, in one event, you know, one application or one script would require uh, a few more dependencies if it was updated. So I was, uh, and around this time, I was also using Linux containers quite a bit. And I really liked the application of containerizing environments that you can then deploy on multiple computers. And it will remain the exact same in terms of functionality. You won't have to do anything else. You just plug and play and you have the exact same toolkit that you had on your laptop at home. Right. Um, and then winding off, you know, Docker is extremely resource efficient and the tools and images can be easily updated and pushed to all the users who use them. 
All right. So that concludes the presentation aspect. I'm not going to get started with the practical demonstration. So I'm just going to bring up my VM here and uh, we'll go into my terminal. So I'm currently running this on a VPS. And uh, the reason for that is because there's much faster internet speed. So again, uh, getting started, uh, we first want to take a look at installing Docker and then enabling the service. So let's do that right now. So I'm currently running Ubuntu here and uh, you can see my kernel version is version 4.15. This is Ubuntu 18.04 LTS. And uh, let me just clear this up and I'll increase the size of the font here so that everything is visible clearly. All right, so to install it, we use the aptitude package manager. So you can also use Pacman if you're using an Arch-based distribution. So apt install, um, sorry, docker, docker.io, right? And you want to hit enter and I already have it installed. The second thing you need to do is you need to enable and start the service so that the Docker daemon is running. All right, so we use system control and uh, you can then say enable Docker and I hit enter and Docker is already enabled on my system. So that means it will run at startup. I highly recommend that you do this if you start using Docker regularly and then I want to start the service and then um, I can say system control status Docker, right? And that gives me the status of the Docker service. You can currently see that it's active, it's loaded and active and it's running. So that means we can now utilize Docker. All right, so I'll take you through the essentials now. Um, so first of all, let's talk about uh, Docker images and containers, right? So Docker images are uh, essentially just your, your VM uh, templates, right? So these are environments that are pre-built and can be easily downloaded and, and then, you know, turned into containers, right? So again, you can find Docker images on the Docker Hub, right? So the Docker Hub is like a repository for all, you know, uh, Docker images that are publicly available. So for example, if I wanted to look for the Ubuntu Docker image, I would simply search for Ubuntu. If I wanted to run a container running Ubuntu, I just hit Ubuntu here, and that will take me to the official Ubuntu Docker page here on the Docker Hub. And it gives me instructions on how to pull this Docker image, right? So let's talk about that right now. So as I said, we have Docker images and we have Docker containers. To view your Docker images, we type in Docker images, right? And that gives me a list of all the images that I have. You can look at your Docker images as ISO files, right? Or installation files for VMs, except they're already pre-configured and you don't have to do anything at all. So uh, a better example or a better analogy of looking at that is looking at Docker images as OVA or OVF files for VirtualBox. Right, so you just you just set them up and it's much faster. It immediately sets up the container and you now have an environment. So in my case, I have OASP Juice Shop, Kali Linux Rolling, the bug bounty toolkit that I created, uh, ParrotSec or ParrotOS, and the damn vulnerable web application. All right, so these are the images that I can use to create containers, right? And to do that, uh, if I list my, my current containers that I have running and to do that, I have type in Docker PS, a, you can see we have zero containers uh, currently running, which are your VMs now, but nothing is running. And the important thing to take a look at when, when you're taking a look at your images is you have your repository name and the image ID. So the image ID is a unique identifier that will also be there with containers. You'll have unique container IDs. This will allow you to uniquely identify your images because you can also install various versions of images of images. So for example, if I say Docker pull and I'm pulling from the Docker hub repository, so I say Docker pull, if I say Ubuntu and I hit enter, that's going to pull the latest version of Ubuntu, right? So wait, I'm just going to wait for that to pull. And there we are. So now if I say Docker images to list my images, you can see we have Ubuntu and this is running the latest version, which is 20.04. If I want to pull version 16.04, I can also do that by saying Docker pull Ubuntu 16.04. And to do that, I would need to use the, the colon here. So 16.04 and I hit enter and that's going to pull Ubuntu version 16.04, which means I now have two versions that I can set up. All right. So again, Docker images, let's say I want to run a, a container, you know, for Ubuntu 16.04. So I'll just copy the image ID here, the unique image ID identifier. And to get started, uh, if I want to run a container from an image, I simply type in Docker run, and then I specify various arguments. So in the case of Ubuntu, this is an environment that I can actually interact with using a an interactive terminal or a TTY session. So to specify that I want to interact with this container through a terminal, I type in 
IT. So that means interactive session. And then I can specify a name for this container. In this case, I'll just call it test, right? And then I specify the container, uh, sorry, the image ID, which I just paste in. And then I specify the shell that I want to use. In this case, it's going to be bash. Sorry, the, the I'll just specify the absolute route to bash. Um, and I hit enter. And uh, you'll see now that I'm currently logged in on that container. So this is the Ubuntu container. And I can confirm that by typing in cat etc issue. And you can see it's running Ubuntu 16.04 LTS. So I'm currently in that container. And now I'm, as, because I'm in that container, I can do whatever I want. And this is essentially like a VM, right? And the interesting thing is, remember, it's sharing my host operating system kernel. So it's, it's sharing my host OS kernel, which is version 4.15. Okay, so now I can do, you know, pretty much whatever I want. And it's a fully isolated container or a VM, which means anything I do in here doesn't affect the system. And it's currently persistent, which means this container is going to be saved and any work that I've done, any files that I've stored on it will be available. So for example, if I just go into my home directory and I say vim test.txt and uh, I don't have vim installed, so I'll just install that apt. Um, so I'll say apt update and apt upgrade let's see, let me just upgrade my packages as well sorry um let me just correct that command here there we are and then i'll install vim in a second here and we'll just create a file with a bit of content so there we are just run an upgrade here that's going to upgrade any of the packages there we are and, and now i can say apt install vim and uh, that's going to take about 54 megabytes. That's fine. That's going to set up Vim for me now. And uh, there we are. I'll just uh, run the previous command where I created the file. And I'll just say, this is some text, some text data. And I'll save that. And now when I want to exit from a container, I hit exit, right? And that's going to take me back to my, uh, to my host operating system. So now that we've talked about images, now we have our containers. And to list our containers, we say Docker PSA. And you can now see, if I reduce my font size, the, the container is listed here. And remember, we gave it a name, and the name is also specified. So it gives us the container ID and the image that was used to create this container and the command that we ran with it, which is bin bash and the status. This is very important. The status tells you whether the container is currently running or is in an exited state, which means it's shut down. In our case, you can see it's, it's telling us that the container is in an exited state, which means it's currently not running. And uh, again, if we want to start up the container again, we say Docker. Now we specify the container option. So Docker container start, and then we specify the name of the container, or you can specify the container ID. We hit enter that's going to start it right but it's not going to take us into that container or log us into that container however if we hit docker psa you can now see the status is telling us that it's up right and it gives you the history of how long it's been up in this case it's 10 it's nine seconds if we hit it again it's now 17 seconds so on and so forth so the current the container is currently running uh, and to attach ourselves to it or to log in or to actually get a terminal session, we need to say docker container attach. Sorry, that is that is attach here. Uh, and we specify the name of the container or the container ID. And that is going to log us in. There we are. So now, again, we can check the directory, the home directory where I created the test file. And there we are. You can now see we have the test.txt file that we created. So the changes have been persisted, right? And again, you can also create containers that you can use one time and then after you're done or once it, you exit from the container, it actually just deletes the container for you. And to do that, we use the docker rm command. So again, if I just want to delete this container, so I say docker remove or rm and I say test, right? And that's going to exit. So now if I list my containers, you can now see we have no containers running. All right. Now, now that we have that done, um, we can actually start taking a look at uh, various tools uh, that we can set up now that we understand the basics of using it. So first of all, I want to start off with Kali. Uh, and uh, you can you can find Kali on the Docker Hub. All you need to do is type in Kali and you're typically looking for the rolling version, which has the latest repositories. Again, so to pull it, you just hit you just copy the Docker pull command here. And since I already have it pulled or because it's actually updated, but so I'll just pull it one more time just to make sure that I have the latest image. 
yeah so i do have the latest image so again running it is very simple it's very similar to ubuntu we simply say run and now because i want to delete the container once i'm done i specify it for an interactive uh, terminal and then i specify rm that will ensure that the container is deleted once it's in an exited state right and then i specify the um I then specify the Kali, uh, the Kali uh, Linux image, right? So let me just get the the ID of the image, which is uh, right over here. So that is the unique image ID. So Docker run it rm, and uh, I will then want to specify a name here. So again, I'll just specify name, and we'll just say this is a test, and we specify the ID and bin bash, right? And I hit enter and there we are. So now we are currently in the Kali box. And again, I can confirm this by saying cat Etsy issue. Apologies for that. There we are, cat Etsy issue. And we tell you uh, we are currently running Kali Linux uh, rolling, uh, rolling edition. So now that we have access to the Kali repositories, uh, this Kali image doesn't have any tools installed. So you need to configure it to your uh, to, to, to what you would prefer. So again, I can say, you know, apt update, and then I can install all the tools that I want, for example. And this is the great thing about running Docker is the images are lightweight, and you can set up only the tools that you're going to use. So apt install, let's say I wanted to install a few bug bounty tools, I can say I want nmap. Uh, um, let's see, uh, we can install FS as well, uh, DNS enum, and we have GoBuster. And this is the great thing of having the Kali repositories, is you can install all of these tools with one click. And if you run it on a VPS, the internet connection is extremely fast, and you can set all of these tools up relatively quickly. All right, so I'll wait for this to install. Uh, so it's installing quite a few tools. And uh, you can see how easily e how easy it is for me to set up an instance with all the tools that I need. But this is still cumbersome because I need to install them. So again, if we type in GoBuster, that works. And maybe I wanted to install something like WordPress Scan. Uh, and you can see it's extremely easy. I don't need to do any setup, install any dependencies. The repositories automatically do that for me. And uh, there we are. It just takes a few seconds. And uh, now I have an environment uh, that I can use and one that is tailored to, to what I need as opposed to, you know, a system that has tools that you probably will not use or will rarely end up using. So there we are. So that's how to use Kali. Uh, now, because I specified R, the RM uh, option, you can now see that after the container is in an exited state, it is currently not running, which is what we, it's currently not running. And it got deleted, which is exactly what we want. We don't want a you know, persistent session of a box that we used for pen testing. So let's talk about ParatOS. ParatOS uh, comes with a few tools. As you can see, the size is huge. It's about 4.7 gigs. And um, again, to run it, we simply, we can run the previous command and just remove the Kali ID here and replace it with the ParatOS uh, image ID. So there we are, we hit enter, and uh, we're now in ParatOS, and we get the familiar ParatOS terminal. And uh, we can now, uh, because I think we had the tools installed, Nmap is available. We have WordPress scan also set up, um, so we'll wait for that to load. And uh, there we are. Joom scan, do we have a GoBuster? Let's see if we have GoBuster, so we don't have GoBuster installed. Uh, so you might have to install the tools that are currently missing, but uh, Parrot has done a very good job. I'll, I'll give them credit. They've done a better job than Kali because Kali doesn't install anything for you, which I understand they actually use this for, you know, custom images and solutions that, you know, you might want to use if you're hosting a CTF uh, and you want to install only a certain or specific tools. So again, Parrot OS is quite good. You have access to the Parrot repos. Um, let's see if we have GoBuster here. So apt. I'm not really... Uh, sure whether the Parrot OS has uh, the Parrot. Yeah, so you can see in the case of the Parrot uh, of Parrot OS, I've actually updated my uh, repositories here. Let me just update the Parrot repositories because I think it does have GoBuster. There we are. Yes, yeah, so it does have GoBuster. So again, you can install the tools that are currently missing. And uh, both the Kali and the Parrot OS uh, repositories are extremely useful and they have multiple tools that you can use to set up your own environment and use in pen tests or bug bounty assessments. And it's much better because, you know, for example, in my case, I can have all my tools in running in one terminal 
and and then of course i can run my proxy which is burp or as view shop on the host operating system and i don't need to use any vms or anything you know like that that will take up huge amounts of system resources so this is quite excellent that way all right um, now let's take a look at the bug bounty toolkit which is the toolkit that i set up and has all of the tools that you'd use in a bug bounty assessment or when you're performing bug bounty hunting and you can find this on this repository here um, so github.com uh, alexis ahmed and bug bounty toolkit and again you can pull the image uh, you also have the docker file on my repository so you can customize the docker file the docker file essentially just contains all the instructions to build the docker image so you can see it contains all the the tool installation and dependency setups so again you can also find this on the docker hub so bug bounty um bug bounty toolkit i'll just search for it here uh, it should be the first option there we are hack exploit bug bounty toolkit and it was just updated a few days ago and uh, this is the list of tools that you it currently has so uh, you know bucket finder uh, dns recon dear search mass dns nikto recon ng all set up and ready to go so i already have the latest version but i'll just pull it one more time and um, we can then start talking about the uh, pen testing environments and uh, setting up your own virtual hacking lab all right so now that we have the image i say docker images sorry my apologies uh, my keyboard is right in front of my microphone here so docker images and there we are we have the bug bounty toolkit so i'll just copy that so docker run uh, i'll just specify the it option first and then rm and we specify the um the name or the image id here and uh, that is it and we specify bin bash i also have a z shell or these uh, zsh so again bin bash there we are and we're now in the bug bounty toolkit so if i list my current home directory you can see we have the toolkit directory i also have the sec list word list configured so again if i i can run any of the tools that you typically use for bug bounty so dear search for example uh, recon ng is fully set up and can be used uh, without setting without any dependencies needing to be installed there we are also have nmap set up uh, nikto and all of the other tools that you can check out so again you can see there's there's no end to the environments that you can set up with the tools that you require and there's multiple toolkits out there you know for various things like android pen testing reverse engineering uh, of android applications so all you know tools like apt apk tool so on and so forth right so you can see we have plenty of environments that you can set up now the real power of docker comes from devops right because this is where docker is usually deployed the most so you know uh, devops companies or companies that develop web applications uh, the the problem that they usually had was when they sell these pro these web applications to companies they need to also send installation instructions and setup instructions I, most of you already know this so for le let's say i want to buy a web application for my for you know for my business and let's say it is a it is a reservations booking system and uh, so the what will happen is the developer will send me a whole list of instructions or installation instructions that need to be done before i can actually set that that web app up you know stuff like uh, installing php mysql apache you know essentially setting up the lamp stack and then installing uh, all the dependencies which is extremely cumbersome for customers or clients because it can become uh, you know extremely difficult for them to set it up and they often then have to uh, to, to, to get the developer to set it up for them and this wastes the developer's time and the developer then has to you know communicate with the clients and this becomes a real mess so docker has really really shined in in the, in the devops community because you can essentially build a docker image once with all the dependencies that the application needs and you can deploy it a million times without having to set up a single thing now a common example of this is of course vulnerable web applications right so for example OWASP juice shop and you can find all the vulnerable web applications uh, under OWASP.org under project vulnerable web applications directory and you have a list of all of them so you have offline the online version so you have the OWASP net goat uh, cloud goat uh, like you have tons of them that you can set up to learn bug bounty hunting to also you know set up CTFs and in the case of os view shop you need to you need to install uh, a few you know of uh, quite a few dependencies so again it becomes quite cumbersome setting it up over and over and you know when you're learning the, the last thing you want to be doing 
is taking you know more than one hour setting up your environment right so again it's uh it really 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 is is very very simple all you need to do is say uh you know, Docker pull, just pull the image, and then right at the bottom here of the repository, it gives you instructions or on on actually deploying it with Docker. And uh, in this case, we'll also be exposing this image to the internet through a particular port because it's running a web application. And with Docker images that host web applications as opposed to entire systems, you don't need to interact with them via terminal because all you need to do is just run them once. And once they're running, you then, you know, uh, because you're exposing the IP onto the internet, um, you can easily then access it through a URL like so. So again, I'll just pull the image and I'll show you this right now. As opposed to installing, you know, all the dependencies, setting up a LAMP stack, this is how easy it is to do it with Docker. So I pull the image, I say Docker images, and I have the, the new shop right over there. I just copy it. So I say Docker run, and then I specify uh, RM. So I want to delete the container once I'm done or once the this is an exited state. And then I specify my port options, right? So the port options are quite simple to understand. Uh, the first uh, the first port that you specify is your local port. So on what interface you're binding to on your host operating system. And then the second port is going to be the container port that you want to expose. In the case of OS View Shop, the recommended port is 3000, uh, 3000 on both ends. So we say 3000, 3000. And we then specify the the Docker uh, ID image ID and hit enter. All right, so we'll wait for that. And uh, it's going to say all uh, dependencies are satisfied. So it gives us some output and tells us the server is now listening on port 3000. All right, so now to test this, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get my server IP. And um, again, I can do that really simply. Let me just do that right now. All right, so I have my server IP address, and this is just a, uh, a VPS, so that will not be available. Once I'm done with it, I'll just delete it after. So again, I'll just hit in the IP here and the port 3000, and there we are. OSP G Shop is set up without any, without installing any dependencies, doing any of the you know configuration and all of the you know all of the the all the the deployment um you know deployment techniques and you know installing dependencies setting up the database and i immediately can host this for a ctf or if i want to learn about specific vulnerabilities i can set this up multiple times right so i can also set up multiple other containers on other ports uh, for example if i go back to my terminal here and uh, let's say i close this but uh, before i do that i want to run this in a detached state so if if i if I list my um, my current containers, you see I've exited from the container. So if I reload this, you'll see that this will not be active now. So in, let's say I also want to run this the same image uh, under the port 3, 3000 on a uh, and I want to run it in a detached mode so that the container is left running and I can also deploy other images. So I can say Docker run specify in a detached mode and that's going to run it and uh, now once it's set up I should be able to access it so we'll give it a few seconds to set up the environment because it does need to set up various options and the background so there we are and uh, OF view shop is now running and then I can also run my other images like Kali if I'm using the tools there so I can say docker run and again I can then run the the Kali image or parrot OS for example so docker run um, and I can say ITRM, paste that in there, bin, and bash. And now I can run multiple inst multiple containers at the same time. So you can see I'm currently running Parrot, and I'm also running uh, OS View Shop. So it really is fantastic and much more efficient than running multiple VMs, right? So again, I can use this, and when I'm done, I just hit exit, and that container is not persistent, so it's, it gets deleted immediately. I don't need to do anything else. And there we are. So again, the the, the Docker the Docker OS View Shop container is running. So again, I can I can just get the container ID and they say Docker container stop. Paste in the ID and I hit enter. And now that container has been deleted because I stopped it. And now OS View Shop is not running anymore. So it's it's it really is quite awesome. All right, that being said, let's take a look at one more other vulnerable environment here, Docker images and how to set it up, which is the damn vulnerable web application, which is really is fantastic. So I'll just search for it right over here. And um, I'll also show you a few other 
awesome things you can do with the Docker Hub before we conclude this presentation. So DVWA, right? And I just hit enter and uh, you have plenty of images that have been set up by many people. So again, uh, if we click on this one right here, which is the one I use, you can see it gives you options as to how you can run it. You can also specify or change the MySQL password. So running it, running it is, uh, is very, very simple. We need to run it in a detached mode and then specify the port. So again, I'll just say, uh, we'll just say Docker run and uh, I'll just copy the image ID for the uh, damn vulnerable web application here. And I'll say this is going to be in detached mode. And I want to get rid of this container when I'm done and uh, then specify the port. So before I, I actually paste in the ID here, I'll just specify the port. So we're exposing port 80 and port 80 there. And uh, we then specify the image ID and uh, just confirm that that's the way to deploy it. And you can also, again, then, you know, expose the, the MySQL database if you're going to be attacking that as well. So I'm going to hit enter and that's going to run in the background. So Docker PSA. You can see it's been up for two seconds and it's exposed on the on your on your server port right there. So again, if we just load this on port 80 now, just gonna hit enter. We're gonna give that a few seconds, and there we are. Damn vulnerable web application is already set up and it's now asking us to create or reset the database. So I'm just gonna see create here, and it's gonna say the database was created, and we can now log in to the damn vulnerable web, web application. I'm just gonna log in with the default credentials. And I believe they are admin and password. And immediately we, we have set up a vulnerable web application that we can use for lessons, uh, for learning about vulnerabilities. So for example, command injection. Uh, let's see, if I want to run a few commands here, you can say cat etsy password. And uh, you can see it's telling us we've entered an incorrect IP. So if we modify the security here, I just want to demonstrate that uh, you can actually perform these, you can test these vulnerabilities with a high amount of security. So again, we can then say, you know, run the following command cat etc password to, uh, to display the password file. And there we are. So you can really, really use Docker in multiple ways for bug bounty hunting and pen testing. Uh, in this particular presentation, I've just gone over how to set it up, you know, for how to set up your environment, your tools. And then, of course, I've been talking about how to set up, you know, your vulnerable, uh, vulnerable environments that, again, you can use for lessons and uh, many other things. So, again, you have access to multiple vulnerabilities here, file inclusion. Um, again, so you can click on file one and then again, it tells you your IP and stuff like that. So, yeah, pretty cool stuff. All right. So uh, thank you very much for having me uh, during this presentation. I really, really appreciate the, uh, the welcome. And uh, again, if you have any questions regarding this presentation, you can reach me at on Twitter on under Packersploit. And uh, that is, uh, you can you can reach me there and send me any of your messages. If you have any questions, again, you can reach me on my Twitter handle, which is Hackersploit. And uh, thank you very much for watching this presentation. And uh, yeah, have a great day.